So when Pastor Edna called, she said, let's do something on the Holy Week. I said, all right. So I looked up the information on God's Holy Week and weeded through all the stuff that's on there and found most of the good information. What does it mean? Holy Week begins on Palm Sunday, which we've already had. Palm Sunday has already come and gone, but it was a very important day for Jesus Christ. As we commemorate the triumphant entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem when the palm branches were placed in his path to begin his final week. All four of the Gospels recount this triumphant entry into this, uh, that Sunday morning so long ago but made current to us on this day. Jesus returned that evening to Bethany, and a suburb, which is a suburb of Jerusalem, with the twelve, and perhaps with his friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And if you remember in the scriptures also, Mary, the day before when he had come to Bethany on Saturday, it was Mary who took and broke open the spikenard, that expensive oil, and then took and used her hair to anoint his feet completely. And to me, that's still an important thing to be talked about in, in connection with the Holy Week because the thing about it is that with a female, the hair, their hair is their covering. It is considered to be their glory. All females' hair is their glory. And so basically what she was doing when she got down there and was rubbing her, his feet with her hair and that expensive spikenard, and you know that that must have stayed in her hair for a long time after that, but she was literally putting her glory at the feet of Jesus. And that's the way we should all be at all times, putting our glory at the feet of Jesus because without him, we are nothing. Then he made the triumphant entry. The importance of this in Jesus' ministry is evident from the fact that all four of the Gospels did record it. The scene now shifts from a quiet dinner with a few close friends in the small town of Bethany. We see next a noisy public parade through the streets of Jerusalem. This was the only public demonstration that Jesus allowed during his entire earthly ministry. In Matthew 21, starting at verse 1, it talks about Jesus sent two of his disciples into the village. It didn't say which two. He just sent two of his disciples into the village to find an ass tied in a colt with her that never a man had sat on. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, Zechariah, saying, tell me, tell the daughter of Sion, behold, your king comes to you, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus is literally saying when he rode in that day, I am the Messiah, I am your king. And he's doing it openly for everyone to see and everyone to hear. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down palm branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And when he was come near, even now at the, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Josephus, even Josephus the historian, said that during that time or at that specific time, there were a few million people that were in Jerusalem at that time. In other words, the Jews came from all over for this time. No telling what it was other than we know it was the Holy Spirit that was drawing all these people to this big event in Jerusalem at the time. And some thousands of Galileans who had seen Jesus perform miracles would be there. And they believed him to be the Messiah King. Spreading their cloaks on the road was a way of showing the honor and praise. Cut palm branches from the trees. They were symbolic of joy after victory. Used on this occasion, it signaled their belief that Israel's Messiah has arrived. 
And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. These phrases both clearly indicate that Jesus is being recognized as the Messiah. It was a historic moment. So now you know that 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy have now run out because next comes the Messiah will be cut off. And that's talked about in, in Daniel chapter 9. And riding into Jerusalem in this manner, the Lord Jesus has made a deliberate unveiled claim to being the Messiah. And when he was come into Jerusalem and into the temple, he wept. See, when Jesus came, he knew it was, uh, it was a celebration for everyone that was around him because they knew that their Messiah had arrived. But Jesus knew the truth of what was coming. He knew that they were going to reject him. And instead of him being able to bring it into himself to be able to celebrate with them, he began to weep. He wept over it, saying, If you had known... Even you, at least this your day, the things which belong to your special peace, to your peace. He's trying to tell them, he's making the announcement, if you had only known, this would be your day to recognize and accept me as your Messiah. But the rejection has already happened, but now they are hid from your eyes. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went back out to Bethany with the twelve. As Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, he uttered his second lamentation over the city that had missed its golden opportunity. If the people had only received him as Messiah, it would have meant peace for them. Now it was too late. They had already determined what they would do with the Son of God. Because of their rejection of him, their eyes are blinded, because they would not see him, they would no longer see him. And in John 12, 19, it talks about the Pharisees were beside themselves with anger. Nothing they said nor did had the slightest effect in curbing the enthusiastic crowds around him. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive you how you prevail nothing Angry with frenzied exaggeration, the Pharisees cried, Behold, the world is gone after him. How soon that tide would change. This was a very special day because on the 10th of the month of Nisan, perfect lambs are set apart for each of the household and inspected for the Passover sacrifice. Well, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it was the 10th of Nisan. God's calendar is the calendar we go by, and that's what we look at. This is mirrored by Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan as the sacrificial lamb of God. He is inspected over the next four days before Passover as the lamb of God. Monday of Holy Week, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus returns to Jerusalem. And seeing shameful practices in the temple area, he cleanses the temple. And he does it with gusto. I mean, he, uh, he goes around kicking tables over, throwing pins out, and sheep start scattering everywhere. The only one that he did not disturb, though, out of all of them, he did not disturb those that had the doves. The doves that they had there were for the poor. And he wasn't going to tear those up. He just asked them, please take them outside. They don't belong in my father's house. John's gospel also records that he rebuked the unbelief of the crowds. Jesus curses the fig tree, then explains the fig tree, and in Mark eleven nineteen, he records that he returned to Bethany that, that night. Of course, when he leaves to go to Bethany is when he curses that fig tree. And then it's the next day when they're coming back that he explains to them about the fig tree. We'll get a little more into that in a second. The unbelief of the people. John chapter 12, 36 through 37. While you have light, 
Believe in the light that you may be the sons of light. These things spoke Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. They were looking for a mighty warrior to come riding in on some stallion, you know, with his armor on and his sword and all ready to take on the Romans and kick them out of Israel. They weren't expecting a lowly, meek carpenter to come riding in on a donkey. That's not what they were looking for and not what they wanted. They were screaming, Hosanna, on Sunday, but then a few days later, they've all changed their mind because this isn't what we expected and this is not what we wanted. Jesus then cleanses the temple and then they came into Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast them all out that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man even carry a vessel. They weren't even allowed to carry a vessel of any kind throughout the temple and said to them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. This is the second time Jesus made the temple ritually pure. The other time was at the beginning of his ministry, and quoting from Isaiah 56, 7, he reminded them that God intended the temple to be a house of prayer. They made, a, made it a hangout of thieves. This cleansing of the temple was his first official act after entering Jerusalem, by it, he unmistakably asserted his lordship over the temple, which is his house. And then he withered the fig tree. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Verily I say to you, this is out of Matthew chapter 21, 21, If you have faith and shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe that those things which are said shall come to pass. You shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, he said you'd even be able to kill a fig tree. If it's not producing fruit, if you have a tree that is not producing fruit, you just say to that fruit, you'll give fruit to no one ever again. That fruit tree will die. It will dry up and you will have to replace it. He said, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, be you removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now here he's talking about a literal, not a figurative mountain. He says, if you will believe that those things can be done or will be done, that these things will happen. The same that he says in John 14 where it says, you will do these things I do and greater. Amen. Amen. Therefore I say to you all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing that you receive, you shall receive. And when you stand praying, forgive. Here's one of the biggest things. If you're not forgiving, God's not forgiving of you. And if he's not forgiving of you, he's not hearing your prayer either. Amen. Yes. You shall receive. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you and your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Tuesday of Holy Week, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus again returns to Jerusalem where he is confronted by the temple leadership for what he did the day before, you know, cleansing the temple, kicking everybody out. They question his authority. He also teaches extensively using parables and other forms. There is the parable of the two sons, the parable of the vineyard, the parable of the wedding banquet. There is also teaching on paying taxes, and the rebuke to the Sadducees who deny the resurrection. There is also the fearful prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem because the inhabitants did not come to faith in him. He warns that not one stone will be left on another. So you see, this is a holy week, but, the, but Jesus doesn't skip a beat. 
during the entire time. He's still teaching and preaching. He's telling them about what's coming. He's prophesying and letting them know this is what's coming up for you not too far in the future. And then he also, in the next, in, on uh, Wednesday, then he also starts telling them about what's going to be coming in the far future. The parable of the two sons and the wicked tenants and the parable of the wedding feast, these three parables are a series. In other words, they build upon one another. The scope of the parable of the two sons encompassed Israel's leadership, their failure in the vineyard. They were self-focused instead of out-focused. They were looking at themselves rather than looking on all those that they should be bringing into the kingdom. The parable of the wicked tenant farmers exposed the leader's lack of responsibility and their guilt to the people listening in as well as to the leaders themselves. In other words, they, the ones that they were teaching were just as guilty because they weren't doing, doing anything to find out for themselves what the truth is. They were listening to all of the things that the rabbis were teaching that were contrary to what it was saying in the Old Testament, in the law but they believed the rabbis over what the law said. So they were just as guilty as the rabbis. And loss of the lead role in the harvest to the church, in the harvest to the church, which is both Jew and Gentile. In other words, they lost that role to gather the harvest in. That fell to the church. But now remember, the church is both Jew and Gentile. And once you come in as a new creature, you're neither Jew nor Gentile. This last parable is the broadest of the three. It condemned the, the contempt with which Israel as a whole had treated God's grace to her. That was talking about the wedding feast. He, he, he said, you've treated my grace with total contempt. Jesus then tells of the temple destruction. Jesus prophesies of wars and persecutions, and he tells about the parable of the fig and the oak trees. And any time he talks about a parable of a fig tree, he's talking about Israel. Now the oak trees, that's talking about the nations. Israel and the nations. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. I think if you're watching national news right now, you're seeing that. You're seeing that all going on right now. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. And he spoke to them the parable to behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, in other words, when they start to bud, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now near at hand. So likewise, you, when you see these things come to pass, the things that he just got through talking about, Know you that the kingdom of God is near at hand. We know that our kingdom of God is near at hand. And Jesus is getting closer and closer. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. There are many who hate the appearing of Jesus, who will mock and harass all who believe and long for his appearing, calling them backward, insane, unfit for society, or just simply escapists who can't handle life. I've got news for them. At the moment, this reflects such much of what's going on in society today. This, unfortunately, also includes many false teachers, false prophets, wolves hiding in the church among those that are called by God. And Jesus said, watch yourselves. Be on the watch. That is one of the biggest things that Jesus talks about and God talks about at all times. He said, be on the watch. Well, what are you supposed to be watching, up, watching for? Well, he told you everything in here you're supposed to be watching for. The disciples of Jesus should guard against becoming so occupied with eating, drinking, and mundane cares of life that, that his coming 
might happen unexpectedly. This is talked about in Luke chapter 21. That is the way it will come on all those who embrace the earth as their home. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape. You have to be worthy to be able to escape all the horrors that are coming. And how are you worthy? You're following Jesus. Amen. All these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Wise disciples watch and pray at all times, separating themselves from the ungodly world which is doomed to experience the wrath of God and identifying themselves with those who will stand in acceptance before the Son of Man. They're going to be calling us all kinds of names. They're going to be ridiculing us. We're not going to hide. Does it look like I'm hiding? I'm not hiding. When I walk around everywhere I go, this is my uniform. This is what I wear. And I get all kinds of different looks, some of them good, some of them not so good, and some of them downright angry. But that's okay. I'm not hiding from anyone who it is that I serve. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're always supposed to be shining our light out for the, for the world to see. He also talks about the beginning of the birth pangs and the great tribulation and his glorious return. And he also gives a, a complete rundown on what it means to be a faithful servant. He also gives the parable of the ten virgins, and everybody knows that the ten virgins, the reason why there's ten, because they're split in two. We have a church that is split in two. We have a church where there are wise Christians that know that they need to keep their oil full at all times, staying in touch with Jesus Christ and keeping the Holy Spirit constantly in their lives so that they're, they become so full and overflowing with oil and then there's those that are unwise that believe that they can come and sit and they've got their fire insurance. Well, they have their fire insurance. Of that, we're very glad that we do have all those that have their fire insurance, but they have no oil. And they run out of it continuously, and they have troubles and problems, and they're the ones that we see and watch all the time surrounding us, having all the issues of life going on in the things that are happening to them. And all we can do is tell them if you need to get close to God. And they go, oh, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, so that's, but that's okay. If that's the kind of life they want to lead, then they will be looking from the back of the room. That's not where God wants them. God wants the best for everyone. And that's why he's made it so easy, so easy for them. That's the reason why Jesus came to begin with. He came and became the final sacrifice for all men and paid the entire price for all sin. He made it easy for all of us. All we have to do is accept the gift and walk in his light. Amen. Amen. All right. He also talked about the parable of the talents. Don't bury your talent. Get out there and use everything God has given you and show everything that has to do with Jesus Christ and bring the people into the church. He also talked about the judgment of the nations. And then we come to Wednesday. Traditionally, this day was called Spy Wednesday. I don't know why they call it that. I call it uh, more like a Benedict Arnold Wednesday. Because it was on this Wednesday before crucifixion that Judas conspired to hand Jesus over. For this he was paid 30 pieces of silver, and the wicked are besetting Jesus and plotting against him. And then we come to Thursday. Early this day, Jesus had given instructions to the disciples on how to prepare this most holy meal, which will be his last supper. Through the day, they make these preparations, and the Lord's Supper, and in the Lord's Supper, we remember that which Jesus shared with his disciples. The new covenant is then initiated with the bread and the wine. Jesus then washes his disciples' feet to show that no one 
is greater than their master, and if their master is going to get down and wash their feet, then that is the example that they are supposed to be following in all things that they do. Satan then enters into Judas. Peter's denial is foretold by Jesus. In his farewell dis discourse, which was quite long, most of, well, it was all of John chapter 14 in his far farewell discourse, but the first four verses is what hits home. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know, we know the way. Amen. He also talked about the hatred of the world. Men of the world love those who live as they do. Those who indulge, indulge in the lust of the flesh or who live only for themselves, the world is humanity apart from God, apart from grace. This world will despise and hate your love, will scorn your love for Jesus' sake. Christians condemn this world by living holy lives. Therefore, the world will hate you. We are appointed for the one purpose of bearing eternal fruit, but our righteous service in this world will never be appreciated. The world has its own God and religion. It hates without cause. The more Christ-like we are, the closer we are to being branded with his sufferings. There is no limit to the hatred and persecution which the world will vent on us who have ceased to belong to it because of our identification with Christ. And then Jesus also told him, the Holy Spirit's coming. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is out of John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Of course, the Holy Spirit is in the world before this, but he comes in a new way to convict the world and to dwell with and minister to the redeemed. Even though the world rejects Jesus, the Spirit, characterized by truth, bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He does this when he comes on the day of Pentecost. After that, the disciples also testified, empowered by the Spirit. It is important to note that the Spirit comes to the church, the church, and not to the world. This means that he works in and through the church, us. Amen. The Holy Spirit does not minister in a vacuum, just as the Son of God had a body in order to do his work here on the earth, so the Spirit of God needs a body to accomplish his ministries. And the body is the church. The Holy Spirit works through the people in whom he lives, and he should be living in everybody here. So it is important that the church not look or act like the world, making the work of the Spirit near impossible. Jesus did not call us to become chameleons that blends in with the world. He called us to be a separate nation that lifts him up before a world living in darkness. Amen. Jesus did overcome the world. In John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. And we do have peace. When we stay in Jesus, we have peace. Everybody else is going chaos, but not us. Amen. In the world you will have tribulation, but, uh, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Amen. Jesus overcame the world. And then he gives the high priestly prayer. Jesus prayed for you 2,000 years ago, or over 2,000, maybe not quite that many. These words spoke Jesus, lifted, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven. This is in John 17. 
Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him power over all flesh and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. All humanity is given into his hands and that he might give life to that part which yields itself to him. If you've yielded yourself to him, you're a part of this. And this is life eternal, and they might, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have also finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify you me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He wants to be restored back to the glory of the time before the world was even brought into existence. I have manifested your name to the men which you, have, which you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Jesus views the disciples as those whom God gives him out of the world. We are first and foremost God's creation, and he has given all power and authority over us to his Son. Thank you, Lord. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given to them the words which you gave me, and they have received and have known surely that I came out from you. And they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. He's saying, I'm getting ready to leave. But these are going to still be here, and I come to you. Christ has no hands but your hands, and to do his work today. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that, you, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that, you, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. But neither pray I for these alone, speaking about the, uh, the twelve, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Neither pray for I these alone. In other words, all these things that he's praying, he's praying for everyone. Jesus prayed for all of us some time ago. That they all may be one as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. In other words, when our service ceases here, he wants them to all be with him. Be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. 
For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you have sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now that's a heck of a prayer. He then goes to Gethsemane and he prays there as well, three times. And during that time he defeats the flesh. He defeats death at the garden before he ever goes to the cross. He made up his mind then, Father, if it be the will of you to pass this cup from me, so be it. But if not, if I have to drink of this cup, your will be done. The Son always wanted to do the Father's will. And that he did. Jesus is now betrayed and arrested. Jesus faces Annas and Caiaphas who reject him as the Messiah King. Peter denies Jesus three times just as he had foretold. Judas hangs himself knowing he sent innocents to die. Jesus goes before Pilate but Pilate can find no crime. Jesus told him, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus goes before Herod, but gives him no satisfaction. He was wanting a miracle. I want to see him do something, you know, uh, do something magical. How about a miracle? And Jesus said nothing. So since Herod could get no satisfaction, he t sends him back to Pilate. Pilate presents Jesus to the people and says, on this day, I'm allowed to release one person to you. And he brings out the most hideous person that there could possibly be, a man by the name of Barabbas. And he said, now, which of these two do you want? And they shout, give us Barabbas. They also shout, we have no king but Caesar. They have just denied God. Pilate washes his hands of Jesus' blood, and they shout, His blood be on us and on our children. I'm sure their children have thanked them for that. Jesus is now crucified, placed on the cross. Jesus shouts, It is finished, and gives up the ghost. He is then laid in the tomb, and guards are posted at the tomb, and the tomb sealed because they were afraid that he would be stolen or the body would be taken out of there. Little did they know. Then we have resurrection. The sun has risen. In Matthew 28 it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, Salome had bought sweet spices and they, that they might come to see the sepulcher and anoint him. Before the sunrise, the, all of these women of Christ had begun preparations, and as the sun dawned, they set out to complete the proper preparation of their Messiah's body. But they soon discovered that tomb was empty. Then Jesus first appears to Mary Magdalene. And then he appears to many. And there's many scholars that tried to figure out exactly how many people it is. And it can be anywhere from several hundred up to 600 people was who Jesus had shown himself to. I know that there's many teachings out there that says that he was only shown to just a few people. That is not true. He was seen by several hundred people that were in the gardens coming through. They, they heard something about Jesus has risen, so everybody wanted to come and see an empty tomb. And everybody that went to that tomb saw an empty tomb. The graves burst open. That is something that very few people talk about. While Jesus is making appearances to disciples, another event is taking place at the same time. In Matthew 27, 52 and 53, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Jesus, of course, was the first fruits and went into the holy city and appeared to many. You know that had to shock a lot of people. 
Then the report of the guard is changed. The, the guards come and report exactly what happened, but the Sanhedrin then bribe all of the guards and say the body of Jesus was stolen. Jesus walks the road to Emmaus with two disciples. And finally, Jesus appears to the disciples in Luke 24, 36. Then the same day at evening, talking about the same day of resurrection, being the first day of the week, which was Sunday, when the doors were shut, in other words, they had locked the doors where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews because they were still afraid of being uh, taken and imprisoned. And as they, the two disciples from Emmaus, thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. The door was locked, so Jesus just came in. He appeared among them. Of course, he's in a different body now. He's in his glorified body. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts of fleeing and ghosts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet and his side. As they sat at meat, he abraded them. He railed at them. He said, your unbelief, you are faithless and hardness of heart. You were destitute of spiritual perception because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. He appeared to a few folks, but he didn't appear to any of the disciples until now. But none of the disciples, there was only one, I think it was John who believed, but the other, none of the others believed that Jesus had actually risen because they hadn't seen him. And they wouldn't believe the report even of Mary Magdalene. Jesus didn't like that. And he said to them, he said to them, These words which I spoke to you while, while I was yet with you. Well, he's with them now, isn't he? Well, he is, but the thing is, is that he's no longer mortal. He is now immortal. Even though Jesus is there with them, he is no longer mortal as they that all things must be fulfilled. He told them this time and time again, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus reminded the disciples that he had previously taught them that he would fulfill everything written about the Messiah and the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms are all the three major divisions of the Hebrew Bible in Jesus' day. And fulfillment is a divine Necessity. Amen? Selah. And now we do take communion.